Um, first of all, I want to do a review, and that's really the main thing I want to do. But, but first, there, uh, I want to talk before I do the review. I want to talk about a little bit about what was happening in Asia during this time. Uh, well, primarily the leading up to the Middle Ages and the Middle Ages themselves. Just a general overview. We don't really know a lot of the details as far as what the church was doing in Asia. Some people just assume there was no church in Asia. Um, they, they, a lot of times people just believe Christianity just didn't flourish in Asia during this time. But there, but it did, and, and I'll um, share what what I've come across as far as, yes. Oh, I have a question because when they talk about Asia during those times, Turkey was Asia. So we're not talking about the area well, of Turkey. We're no. talking about China, more the All Orient. Right. Or in, in what we call Turkey, there were provinces. One of those provinces was called the province of Asia. Okay. Just like there was the province of Galatia, there was the province of Asia. Um, Ephesus, for example, was in the province of Asia, I believe, which was a little bit like the west end of what we would call Turkey, and then the east end of what we call Turkey, uh, what is Turkey, would be Galatia, and there was a few other provinces in there. Um, so, so yeah, in, in the book of Acts, when it talks about Asia, it's talking about the province of Asia, the west end of that peninsula there. Um, but what I what I'm talking about now is the continent of Asia, um, and even for going all the way back to the first century, there were well established trade routes. And I I should have typed this up on an outline for you, but I didn't. Um, so most of what I'm going to say now will not end up on the test. But but just for your benefit, um, for your overall knowledge. Uh, the, the textbooks that we use and virtually every textbook that you find on church history focuses on Europe, you know, the Roman Empire um, and what's happening in the West. And a lot of times we just assume nothing was happening in the East. But there were well-established trade routes that were heavily traveled um, that went into Central Asia and other another one that went into India. And they were heavily traveled by early missionaries to the east. Uh, it's believed that even um, Thomas went to India to evangelize the Apostle Thomas, and um, and Peter went to different parts of the Near East. Uh, so from the very first century, the church at Mesopotamia had a mission to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and His grace around the world from the beginning they moved through through the various nations on the Asian continent and within the first three centuries of the church they spread the Christian message to Arabia Persia India Tibet and even China now this is only logical if you think what was happening in the West during those first three centuries it was very heavy persecution, right? Um, during the, that, before Constantine, many, if not most, of the Roman emperors were persecuting Christians. Under some of those emperors, Christianity was illegal. So if you're if you're living in an area where you're being persecuted, it just like the reason they fled Jer Jerusalem was because of heavy persecution. Well, it only makes sense that many Christians would flee the Roman Empire if they had the means to do so, and many of them went east. So the church was growing significantly in the east, even though there aren't too many records of it. Um, the, the church was growing significantly in the east. Many, and if not most, of the Asian Christians were Nestorian Christians. Now, um, well, I would say beginning with the fifth, the fifth century, there was a man by the name of Nestorius. Nestorius was the Archbishop of Constantinople from 428 to 431. But Nestorius, you know, I wouldn't say, he, some people will say he was a heretic, and he did have some strange beliefs, but um, 
I would come a little bit short of calling him a heretic because in some ways, one thing that he got very upset about with the Roman church or the overall church system, they started using the phrase, Mary, the mother of God. And he, uh, he strongly objected to that. And because of his objection to that phrase and apparently some other, um, odd, some other things that he was teaching where he disagreed with, with the Catholic system, um, they, they ended up excommunicating him. You know, it's, and that's still a phrase, of course, that, that the Catholic Church, as far as I know, the Catholic Church is the only group of Christians that use that phrase, uh, Mary, the mother of God. Even though Mary is the mother of Jesus and Jesus is God, to say Mary is the mother of God seems to imply that Mary is either deity or that she existed before God, which, of course, is nonsense. But um, many in Catholicism, in fact, I shouldn't say many, the Catholic Church in general elevates Mary almost to a level of deity. And so this guy, Nestorius, strongly opposed that that phrase. And that's one of several issues that he had with the church at that time. So, you know, we say that the first church split was in 1054 when, when that schism between, um, I think it was, Patriarch Michael and Pope Leo the Ninth, if I remember correctly, and they excommunicated each other, and so we ended up with the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. But actually, about 600 years before that, um, there was kind of a mini split in the church with Nestorius because his followers he got excommunicated from the church, but he already had a lot of followers, so he. He went to his former monastery near Antioch. He retired there, but he continued to strenuously defend his his beliefs. And he ended up being sent into exile, where he died in 450 um, in Upper Egypt. But he he is responsible for for his brand of Christianity going eastward into the deep parts of of uh, of Asia. And I think one reason why they're not included in many of the church history books is because many people don't consider them legitimate Christians. Uh, but by the 11th century, well, actually, let me back up a little bit. In China, Nestorian Christianity flourished from the 7th century through the 10th century. And by the 11th century, get this, this is what I... Uh, found this week, and I assume it to be true, there was an estimated 60 million Christians on the Asian continent, wow. which was actually bigger and more numerous than the Christians in in Europe under the authority of the Pope. So, you know, um, I, I, where I teach, the Christian school that I teach at, there are a lot of Chinese students, and they always assume, or sometimes they assume, that... that um, Christianity is not a part of Asia, not a part of Asian history, but it really is. But, however, this is what happened. In the year 1258, the Mongols swept through some of these areas and nearly completely wiped out Christianity. And the contents of, there was a great library in Baghdad, apparently, that had a lot of documentation, but it was all dumped into the Tigris River, nearly eliminating all memory of the large Christian movement. And then at the end of the 14th century, Timur, or also known as Tamerlane, a fanatic Muslim emperor from Central Asia, swept through Mesopotamia, massacring thousands upon thousands of Christians. So Christianity was all but eliminated in, um, in Asia through those two movements. Um, so... Apparently, there have been people that have done some research because they would find uh, in their in their research they would find different Christian symbols on different uh, carved out stones and stuff, and and there was evidence that there were there were Christians early on, and um, 
So this this is a brief summary of what was going on during that time. All right, so that's all I have to say about Asia because it's really just hard to find information about Christianity in Asia, but apparently there was a Christian movement of some kind. Pastor, uh, Kim, aside from uh, this uh, guy's problem with um, Mary, Mother of God, was there anything else that defined this Nestorian Christianity that made it different? Um, let me see. Let me look through my notes here. I think there was something else, but I didn't. it didn't jump out at me this time. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I think he was, in trying to understand Jesus being 100% human and 100% God, um, he, he was teaching that Jesus had two natures. Um, and... Some people made a big deal about that, and I, to me, he's just trying to—he's just trying to find a way to explain how Jesus can be a hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. Um, and when he said Jesus had two natures, what exactly did he mean by that? I'm not really sure. Um, you know, I—that in itself, to me, I wouldn't call that a heretical statement, although some people do. Um, I think he's just trying to trying to find a way to explain it you know how do you explain that jesus is 100 percent god and 100 percent man and um and th there are probably other things but th th that's all that i'm aware of that uh i mean i haven't studied him in detail and maybe i should but beyond that for further study, maybe for extra credit, do do a little bit of research. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me go to my notes on my... I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. Which notes do I want to go to? Okay, so the first part of this test... will be okay well let me just put the test up here so I can just make sure I cover everything on the test all right the first there, there's going to be two two sections to this test the first section there will be a word bank listed listing a lot of the key people that we've learned about in uh, in in these past 10 weeks. A lot of the key people will be mentioned. Nestorius will not be on there. <laughs> but, but for example, maybe maybe I should do this uh, the way the way you did uh, and just ask you questions because otherwise, where, where do I begin? I this mean, there's- It's there, mind boggling. The, the, there's so many people yeah, we read about. Right. Well, who is the founder of Islam? Muhammad. Who wrote the book City of God? Oh, it starts with the C. Phobos? No. 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 It, no, it was Augustine. Oh, Augustine. Now, Augustine, Augustine, the book refers to Augustine as the greatest of the church fathers, and it's probably true because he he influenced a lot of people. He wrote that book, um, City of God, and it was, and I haven't read the book. I probably should, but apparently it talks about how what the what the ideal Christian civilization would look like if everybody were a Christian and they were living fully by Christian principles. What the kingdom on kingdom of God on earth would look like in a city that was fully functioning as a Christian city. Um, I guess I mean that from from what I've read, uh, that the best I can tell without actually reading the book, that's basically what it is. But it influenced a lot of people. People like Clovis and 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 uh, other people uh, that we read about claimed that they got their inspiration from that book, City of God. It influenced a lot of a lot of people throughout the Middle Ages. So the City of God is a book that I make reference to sometimes because it influenced so many people 
and Augustine influenced so many people. Now, who was you mentioned Clovis? Who was Clovis? A bishop. Who was Clovis? What did he? Okay. He was the son of grandson of Charlemagne. Actually, of great grandson of Charlemagne. Did he think. come down from? Did Did he come down from one of Charlemagne's three sons? One of those sons? No. Maybe not. Um, I got it mixed up. No, actually, no. he was an ancestor to Charlemagne. Okay. Oh, he was so, before. so first of all, the okay. <laughs> well, let, let's back up a little bit. Who was the first Christian emperor? Constantine. Constantine. Who was the first Roman emperor to to? Uh, I'll come back to Clovis in a minute, but he's a little bit later, so I'm going to back up to before Clovis. Who was the first emperor to issue persecution? Against Christians, uh, Nero. Nero. Nero, yes. Yeah. Nero. All right. That's under Paul. So, um, yeah. And so, Nero started the persecution against Christians. But who was the last emperor that? instituted heavy persecution against Christians right before Constantine. Uh, but the last one to, who seemed to have a deathbed conversion because he invited people to, to come pray for him, even though he was issuing the, such heavy persecution against them. And he, um, on his deathbed, granted Christians permission to worship again. That was Constantine, what? Grandson, grand, No, this no, was before Constantine. Before Constantine. Uh, the, immediately before Constantine. I, I, you're, ref, you're thinking of um, Justin, I think it was. That was Justin the the, the nephew, uh, <laughs> the apostate. The apostate. Okay. Um, he was the one that uh, that tried to reverse things back to heathenism after Constantine, but. But immediately, the, the emperor immediately before Constantine was Galerius. Now, Galerius was the guy that um, was issuing very heavy persecution. In fact, the book tells us that it was the heaviest and worst persecution of all of them. Um, but yet he got sick, deathly sick, and he invited Christians to come pray for him. He said, pray for me and for the empire. And... Um, and he issued a, you know, an edict or whatever. Uh, yeah, the, it's called the Edict of Glarius, in fact, uh, enabling Christians to to return to worship. Um, so, okay, so let me let me go back to. Okay, so Clovis was. Another man who had a similar experience to Constantine. He was a warrior. He was the leader. Of, actually, he was king of the Franks at the time. And he saw a cross. Constantine, remember, he yeah. saw a cross with the yeah. words in the mm -hmm. sign, conquer. Well, Clovis saw apparently the same vision or something very similar. And he promised God that if he were to win that nearly impossible battle. Uh, if he were to, to win that fight, he would become a Christian, and he did. And so that was Clovis. He was the king of the Franks that had a very similar experience as, as Constantine. Um, and... And then... Ten generations after him, there was okay. Ten generations after him was Charles Martel, and Charles Martel was the one that. Um, was the hero at the Battle of Tours. The Battle of Tours were... See, the Muslims had taken over 
North Africa and the Holy Lands and Spain, and they had marched up in, up into <clears throat> up into southern France, <clears throat> winning victory after victory after victory. But that victory came to an end when they reached the town of Tours, or the region of Tours, whatever it is, and and Charles Martel was prepared and uh, and won that victory. So he was the hero. And then it was Charles Martel's son, Pepin, called Pepin the Short, but Pepin. And Pepin was also a warrior, a warrior leader, just like his father. But Pepin wasn't satisfied with just being um, a warrior. He wanted to be king. And they had a very weak king, and somehow... Pepin was able to put the king in a monastery, but and back then, by this time, the monasteries were becoming more than just a place for holy people to go pray and study. But they, to many people, it became almost like a prison, and apparently, you were able to to put <clears throat> people who were mentally challenged or people that were viewed as going insane or whatever you could put them in the monastery just to get them out of society and somehow Pepin was able to put the king of the Franks in the monastery and then he placed himself on the throne okay so that was Pepin and then his son was Charlemagne oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the other Charles and okay let me uh, see what I've skipped so far okay um, I talked about that already okay the um, all right the Council of Nicaea was a council, a church council that was called for by Constantine. Constantine wanted to settle the issue of, is Jesus God? Now, there were two key bishops in this argument. There was Arius and there was Athanasius. Arius was the guy that was saying, Jesus is the son of God, but he's not God. Um... And he said Jesus is the first and highest created being of God, but he's not God. Um, but then Athanasius, who was quite a bit younger than Arius, he insisted Jesus is, Jesus was and is fully God. God manifested in the flesh. Ultimately, the church sided with Athanasius. And the vast majority of the bishops signed on to the Nicene Creed to state that Jesus is God. And Arius and the teachings of what was called the Arian teaching was deemed heresy. <clears throat> okay, and then... As the gospel began to spread, who was the Apostle of Ireland? St. Patrick. Of course, yes. <laughs> that wasn't Irish. <laughs> yeah, he, he was English, but he, uh, he spread the gospel there. Um, he also had an interesting conversion. Um, who wrote the Latin translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, also known as the Vulgate. Oh, it was in Egypt. He's considered a church father. Not that that helps any. <laughs> that was Jerome. Um... At one point in the Middle Ages where they saw the need for reform, 
um, well, one man specifically saw a need because the monasteries were becoming corrupt. You know, the, the monasteries were initially established to escape from the corruption of the world, the wickedness of the world. But before too long, the corruption inside the monasteries pretty much matched the corruption outside the monasteries. So one man started a monastery in Cluny, a town in France, and it became known as the Cluny Reform because he wanted to return back to the strict standards of the early monasteries of of uh, well, it, it was very very legalistic, but but still he wanted to get rid of the wickedness that was and and return back to a purity and and holiness. I put that in quotes mm -hmm. um, of what the monasteries were originally meant to be. Who was it that started that Clooney reform? I know there's a lot of names to remember. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even want to take a guess. William the Pious. William the Pious. Um, and who is the true head of the church? Jesus. Jesus, yes. Okay, you better not say the Pope. <laughs> Don't say the Pope. Um, <laughs> so what church are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Catholic, which was Church yeah. Universal, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which still would be Jesus. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <sighs> okay, here's a good one. Who was who was the unbaptized Roman governor who was elected Bishop of Milan in 374? Oh my goodness. I remember the story. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> and he turned out to be a pretty good bishop. Yes, he was. He was a good. That's a the good one. Man. The child called out his name. You should, was that the one you're talking yeah, about? Where yeah. the little boy called and said, "Oh, so you should make him." Out? Yeah. <laughs> Don't remember the name. <laughs> that was Ambrose. Ambrose. Yeah, he was. He was as a child. He was. Um, he was in a political family, and as. At a young age, the book didn't say at what age, but as a young at a young age, he was appointed governor, and um, he walked into there was an opening for a bishop, and they were arguing over who should be the bishop. But it apparently, got pretty rowdy, so he went in there to try to calm things down, and someone referred to him as the bishop, and so they they elected him. Yeah, a child cried out, Ambrose Bishop, or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, who was it that had a reputation for holy standards, but also for healing, prophecies, and miracles? And he established 12 monasteries. Do you remember me talking about him? One, one of the few people that actually was involved in um, the supernatural that I've that I was able to find. I don't remember. But I feel like we should know. Um, Benedict of Nursia. Mm. Or Nurse, Nursia, Nursia. I guess it's Nursia. N U R S I A. Benedict. This was. Um, an impressive guy. I mean, from what little bit I found out about him, he, the fact that people would come to him for healing and things like that. Um, okay. All right. So the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, fell in 476, and then in the year 800. The Pope crowned Charlemagne emperor of the um, the new the revived Roman Empire, revived Western Roman Empire, and after Charlemagne died, and Charlemagne was very successful, and and uh, the empire expanded, but after he died, his kingdom was split up into three, or his empire was split up into three kingdoms given to each of his grandsons. 
but because of a new wave of barbarians that were sweeping through Europe, they apparently subdivided their kingdoms into smaller countries, and um, it basically, they were trying to break it up in a way to preserve it, but it ended up crumbling more than anything, and the different nobles were fighting among themselves. And then uh, a generation or two later, there was a man by the name of Otto the Great. Um, when I taught this, I don't remember if I called him Otto the Great or Otto the First, but either way, he's is correct. Otto the Great, he was German. He was a German king that was crowned by the Pope to be the emperor of the new re-revived Western Roman Empire, which he referred to as the Holy Roman Empire. So beginning with... the uh, sometimes when you refer to the Holy Roman Empire, you are referring to Charlemagne, but the best I could tell the first person to use that phrase was Otto the Great. Okay, so this was like the third time the, the Western Roman Empire, you know, there was the original Western Roman Empire, then there was Charlemagne's revived Western Roman Empire, and then this is a re-revived Western Roman Empire, but he referred to it as the Holy Roman Empire. That was Otto the Great that was the king of Germany that became emperor. And another thing about Charlemagne. Um, okay, so he was the son of Pepin. And so he, he was king after, after actually when, when Pepin died, if you remember correctly, Pepin had two sons and it was given to both of them to share. Mm -hmm. And within a couple of years, the brother died and no one seems to know why. Um, but I think it might be assumed that Charlemagne had something to do with that because they didn't get along with each other. Um, from what I uh, had seen in uh, something that I was researching. Apparently, the only way they communicated with each other was through their mother. So they didn't get along with each other. So, but anyway, Charlemagne survived, and he uh, he he was the king before he became the emperor. He was the king of the Franks, and he um, at one point he was fighting with. The Lombards. Now let me back up a little bit more because remember we talked about the Iron Crown? Mm -hmm. What was significant about the Iron Crown? Well, they said it was a nail from the crucifixion. They believed that there, they, they claimed that there was a nail from the cross of Christ in, cross. in the Iron Crown. So, so to make peace with the Lombards, the Pope, and I don't remember off the top of my head which Pope that was, but there was a Pope that made a peace treaty, in essence, with the Lombards by giving them this iron crown. Well, Charlemagne wanted that for himself. So he, <laughs> and that may not be why he fought the Lombards, but in defeating the Lombards and defeating the king of the Lombards, he took the iron crown for himself. And that happened in the year 777. Something, something easy to remember because of the year. 777, that's when Charlemagne took the Iron Crown away from the Lombards. And then in the year 800 was the year that the Pope crowned Charlemagne with what the book calls the Imperial Crown, making him the Emperor. What year was that? When, Eight, when 800, 800, when he became the Emperor. Or he was crowned with the imperial crown by the Pope and declared him to be the, the emperor of, of the revived Roman Empire. Okay, let me look through my... What crown did he give him? Okay. Oh, okay. The imperial crown was imperial what he got. Crown. He took the iron crown in 777 from the Lombards that okay, he had defeated it. and he got the imperial crown from the Pope making him the new emperor of the revived Roman Empire. Okay, let me see if there's any question here that I didn't ask yet or didn't comment on. 
Okay. There was... Um, Okay, so there was this Clooney movement. I think this was a, what I talked about in my last session. Or maybe, maybe this might actually just be, might be one that I did directly into, uh, into the live stream site. But there, there was this Clooney movement started by William the Pious. And William the Pious, well, the Clooney movement was quite... The book refers to it as a revival um, in the Dark Ages, in the in the in the midst of the Dark Ages. Actually, it was the Clooney movement, Clooney reform movement, that helped bring them out of the Dark Ages. Um, it had its biggest impact after William the Pious died, and it influenced at one point at its peak. Apparently, it had something like two thousand um, monasteries. And it influenced the emperor, Henry III. So remember that Henry III was the emperor who was uh, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, who was a very enthusiastic supporter of the Cluny Reform Revival. And he appointed Cluny Reform bishops and even Cluny Reform popes. Because back then, see, the power between the Pope and the Emperor went back and forth. There were times when the Popes were appointing kings and emperors, and there were other times when the emperors were appointing popes and bishops. And this was one of those times where Henry the Third, he was a good man for the most part. He seemed to be a godly man, a good man, but he saw it upon himself as being able to have the authority to appoint bishops and abbots and popes and other positions and so but whenever he had an opportunity to appoint someone into a religious office he would appoint people that were interested in reform the Clooney reform mm -hmm. um so so he so that that's henry the third now his son henry the third died um and then Henry the fourth was only six years old when he became emperor six years old and his his mother's name was Agnes and she ran the show kind of but she wasn't a very strong leader so there was a very weak empire for a little while and Henry the fourth even as he became a man wasn't very popular um, in as as leader he didn't have the popularity or the leadership skills as his dad did and Henry the fourth um, got into a feud with Pope Gregory the seventh now Gre Pope Gregory the seventh was Hildebrand before he became Pope his name was his given name was Hildebrand and he was a very strong leader in the Clooney boom movement and was the power behind six popes he kind of pulled the strings to get six popes consecutive uh consecutively elected um or appointed and then finally he became pope he became pope gregory the seventh and as pope he well i i keep going in different, uh, I keep getting ahead of myself. There was a, um, let's see, I don't see it in my, on my test, so apparently it's not important enough to talk about, but <laughs> there, there was a meeting under Leo the Ninth. This was one of the, Leo the Ninth was a pope that was appointed by Henry the Third before he died. Leo the Ninth had, I think it was called the Synod of 1059, where they made it a determination of a new way to appoint popes and bishops and they were not going to allow kings and emperors to appoint popes and bishops the the it was the church's job to appoint church positions not the secular government what year was that about um that well the synod of 1059 so I'm, okay, if i'm if i'm saying it correctly i'm pretty sure it was 1059 okay. um so Henry the Fourth 
after winning a great military victory, he felt a little extra confidence, and he he ended up appointing three bishops in Germany. And and Gregory the Seventh, the the Pope, found out about that, and he sent a letter to to Henry the Fourth, the the Emperor, saying threatening him excommunication. And to be threatened with excommunication was a serious matter to many of them because it meant many things, not the least of which, if you're excommunicated from the church, that meant to them that you're excommunicated from heaven. <laughs> they saw the church as the ac their, your only access to heaven. So, um, and so, anyway, a few letters went back and forth between Henry the Fourth and. Pope Gregory the seventh but in the end Gregory excommunicates Henry the Pope excommunicates the Emperor and he tells the people of the Empire don't obey him he's no longer your Emperor find someone else to be your Emperor um, and so they end up appointing someone by the name of Rudolph well Henry the fourth finds himself in a terrible situation because now the people there was a popular pope and a not so popular emperor so who do you think the people are going to side with <laughs> they're going to side with the popular pope so they find themselves another emperor which was Rudolph um, which I'll come back to that uh, if, uh, maybe <laughs> but um, Henry the fourth goes to visit the pope to settle this issue because he figures you know we need to get absolution to this so the book says he walks barefooted or he no he he, he approaches the castle of Canossa all right he, he goes through the Alps from Germany to Rome with just his wife his young son and a couple of close friends and it was January, it, there was snow everywhere, it was bitterly cold, and he, um, the Pope is told Henry is on his way, and he has a whole army following him. He's leading an army, which wasn't true. Mm -hmm. He's leading an army into Rome. Well, that kind of frightened Gregory, so he hid in the castle of Canossa. And so when... Henry approaches, he puts his family in an inn someplace, and he approaches the castle by himself. And, um, but Gregory wouldn't see him for three days. So he stood there three days in a row, and in the book it says he was barefooted and bareheaded. I don't know why, <laughs> but he was barefooted and bareheaded for three days <laughs> in the cold, bitterly cold, and Gregory would not see him. Finally, at the close of the third day, he opens the door and lets him in. And Henry bows down and kisses the feet of the Pope uh, and asks for absolution. Absolution means everything's forgiven. Um, and so he, he is able to be restored to his position. So everything, you would think everything was mended. So anyway, if, if I ask the question... <laughs> who was the emperor that was excommunicated Henry it, it's Henry the fourth okay and who was the popular emperor who was an enthusiastic supporter of the Clooney reform movement that would be who that would be Henry the third so don't confuse the two Henry's Henry the third was a brilliant guy a popular guy a um, and he was pushing Clooney reform ideas and that's Henry the third but his son Henry the fourth was not so popular and ended up getting excommunicated by the popular Pope so anyway so Henry the fourth goes back to Germany and Rudolph attacks and Rudolph ends up dying in battle so Henry the fourth keeps his his position but then Henry the fourth his confidence being rebuilt he goes back to Rome this time he does take an army and and uh, completely devastates Rome and uh, Gregory the seventh is able to escape but 
but ends up not being able to go back to Rome. But anyway, I talked about that in, I, I, I think that was a session that I just taught directly to the live stream site um, last week. So, but it, it is on the live stream site. It's also on um, the uh, YouTube channel, but where I went into more detail on that. But I think... The first part, I think I've touched on everything in the first part of the of the test. Okay, so Pope, the key people. Pope Gregory uh, goes into hiding after that. Well, yeah, well, he ends up dying. I mean, he, what happens is, this part isn't on the test, so I wasn't going to review it, but, but, okay, so Henry IV puts his own pope, the book refers to him as an anti-pope, um, on the throne, the papal throne, um, Henry Gregory the Seventh was popular up to that point, and he had, I think it was it was the Lombards, I think, one of those barbaric tribes that were now Christian. He brought them in from southern Italy, asking them to chase out Gregory's people, I mean Henry's people, so that he could come back, and. So these barbarians, I'm thinking they were the Lombards, but I'm, I could be wrong on which tribe it was. But anyway, it was one of those, those Germanic barbarian tribes. They, they came in and they, they not only chased out Gregory's pe or Henry's people, but they devastated Rome, completely destroying the city. And the people blamed Gregory VII. Okay, and the book the book makes it very clear that Gregory the Seventh really had nothing to do with that. He he um, he wanted his papacy back, his papal throne back, but he didn't expect the that group to completely destroy the city. But they so devastated the city that it the book says it was impossible for him to return because the hatred of the people was turned against Gregory. Before then, he was very much loved by the people, but now they they were very angry with him. So he, instead of going back to Rome, he went with, uh, it was, was it the Lombards or the Normans? I'm thinking it's the Normans, not the Lombards, the Normans. Um, so he went back with the Normans back to southern Italy, and he died on the way. So, um, okay, so... Six real quick questions. Because that, that's basically it for the people. Everything I've talked about right now, I've been talking about different people and who they were. Um, but there are certain other words and phrases that the, the second set of, um, the second word bank that I have is other things other than people, but other things like, um, what was it, which I've already talked about, that was believed to have a nail from the cross of Jesus in it. That was the eye and the crown. Okay. Um, what was the year of the fall of the Western Roman Empire that marks the beginning of the Middle Ages? 777? No, that was 476. Oh, 476. No. 777 was, when, was the year that Charlemagne took the oh. iron crown from the king of the Lombards. So the fall of the Roman Empire was 476. Yeah, the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire continued for a while, but the Western Roman Empire fell in 476. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the book says it marks that as the beginning of the Middle Ages. Um, okay, what is the leader of a local church congregation called, and the word means overseer? Bishop. Bishop, because then that may be somewhat of a trick question because the way the church uses that word now mm -hmm. is an overseer of, of other ch many churches, but the way it was used in the Bible, I believe, and the way it was used in the first several centuries of the church, Bishop just was what we would call a pastor. Um, what was the year of the Great Schism? You just told us that. Was that 777? <laughs> I'm trying. That's the easy one I can remember. Um, okay. No, it was a little bit later than that. 
1054, uh, yes, 1054 was okay. when the church the church split. Got it. And that's the great schism of 1054. There's actually another great schism that we'll talk about in um, in the weeks to come, but uh, but this was the first thing that was called the great schism. Um, important meetings of bishops and other church leaders to discuss and decide major doctrinal issues. What are those called? Church, uh, church council. council. Church council. The underground passages and tunnels where Christians hid in times of heavy persecution. Catacombs. Catacombs, yes. All right. Um, what about... Um, what did Constantine call his... He started a school in his own palace. What did he call that school? Call it after himself? <laughs> no, there's something tricky to it. <laughs> Constantine, no, what, did I say Constantine? No, uh -huh. Char Charlemagne, I'm sorry. Charlemagne started a school in his own palace. He called it after himself, didn't no, he? No, he called it the palace school. <laughs> oh, the palace <laughs> school. <laughs> um, okay. I, I think I've touched on everything that's, in, that's going to be on the test, and then some. Any other questions? I know the hardest part probably is going to be all these names. Um, oh, Belinda. Who is Belinda? Belinda? Not Belinda. Blandina. What is it? Blandina. Let me see if I have yeah, a question about her. Yeah. I, I may not even ask. I, I may not even have asked about her. Because she's a she. How many women did we hear about? Blandina was... Um, Spell her name, please. B-L-A-N-D-I-N-A. -N -A. Unless I'm overlooking her. I don't see her on the... On the test, but... Somebody's mother. <laughs> <laughs> Daughter. <laughs> well, the book talks about Monica, who was the mother of... Mother of Augustine, maybe. Yeah, the one that was I think, uh, kind of a wild guy. Yeah, I think and she prayed for him. Yeah, mm -hmm. but Blandina was before that. Blandina was the um, during the time of persecution. There was one specific season oh, of heavy persecution. She would cheer people and, and on. And she she was the, in that season of persecution. It says she was the last to be executed, but before yeah. she was executed, yes. she was mm -hmm. was encouraging people. She was always there cheering them on. Basically, um, I refer to her as a cheerleader. Um, you know, not that she's cheering the execution, but she's trying to encourage them to stay true to Christ. Uh, and ultimately, she got thrown to a wild bull and got tossed in the mm -hmm. air. Um, and that's basically all the book talks about with her. Um, okay. Okay. All right. Well, I would recommend that you, over the next two weeks, review review your book, review, review the uh, the videos at the live stream site or the YouTube channel. Rewatch specifically this review, which will be on the YouTube channel, or it will be on the live stream site anyway. Any other questions before I stop the recording? Mm -hmm.